Forgiveness is a full pardon. It's a fresh start. It's another chance. It's a new beginning. It's the lifting of a heavy burden. It's the canceling of a debt. Forgiveness is the key that unlocks the door of resentment and the handcuffs of hatred. Some of you have those handcuffs on right now. It is a supernatural power that breaks the chains of bitterness and the shackles of rage and resentment. Forgiveness is not optional. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, God will not forgive you of your trespasses. Luke 6, 37, Forgive and you shall be forgiven. The message is clear from one end of the New Testament to the other. If you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you. Jesus Christ taught forgiveness in the Lord's Prayer. When you pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those. The last moment of his life on the cross, he was still demonstrating that love that he wanted us to copy. As they were killing him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. He had the power to call legions of angels. He could have destroyed the Roman Empire with just one word. But he let those men kill him for you to be redeemed. After the resurrection, he continued to, de to demonstrate forgiving love toward Peter. Peter who said, I'll die for you. Jesus said, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. And he did the last time he cursed. I don't know that man. And the first thing Jesus said to those who came, Go tell my disciples that I'm alive and tell Peter. Tell him I want to see him and forgive him. Isaiah 43, 25 says, For your sin and iniquity I will forgive and remember no more. One of the Hebrew translations of remember is it will never be brought up again. You need to remember that. Peter told the Jewish people on the day of Pentecost, Acts 3.19, that your sins may be blotted out. Look at the word blotted, not erased. When you erase something, you can still see the shadows of it. When you take the inkwell and dump it over that piece of paper, it's totally gone. God is eager to forgive. He crumbles the page. He dumps the inkwell of heaven on your record in the books of life never to be remembered anymore. You don't have to beg God for forgiveness. Why should we, who are full of imperfections, withhold forgiveness from each other? Secondly, be reconciled. You take the initiative to go to your brother and sister and make the matter right. Remember, nothing is ever settled until it's settled right. Oh, I'll talk to them sometime. It's been 10 years. Do it now. Forgiveness is possible. It's a new beginning. It's a fresh start. So how do you forgive biblically? Jesus taught us how to forgive one another because there is a pattern. Jesus said, if therefore you are representing your, you are representing your offering at the altar, you've come to the house of God and you're presenting your offering, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Matthew 5, 23, 24. The point is forgive immediately. Stop praying, leave the church. Get reconciled before you believe that God is going to hear your prayer. Stop being religious, stop the facade. God's not listening to you. He will not receive the offering of your phony tears and your hypocritical smile over the stench of an unforgiving spirit. 1 Corinthians 13, 2 through 4. Husbands, listen to this. God does not hear the prayer of a husband who will not forgive his wife. 1 Peter 3 and 7. 
Peter says, your prayers are let. Let is an old English word. We still use it in tennis. When the ball hits the net and goes to the ground, it's let. And you have to do it over. God is saying, husband, when you are being abusive to your wife and you will not come together in a reconciliation with her, when you pray, your prayers hit the net and fall to the ground. George Herbert said, he who cannot forgive breaks the bridge over which he himself must pass. End of quote. Several years ago, I sat beside Corey Ten Boom in Dallas at a luncheon for Christian authors. As we sat there side by side, she described the horror of the Nazi concentration camp where she was sent for helping the Jews escape the iron fist of Hitler's Nazis. There she lost her sister her father, and her nephew. If there was ever a reason to hate, she had one. The beatings, the starvation, the sadistic brutality of Hitler's monsters were etched into her brain. For years, she kept records of those who had abused her after she got out of the prison camp. Every offense, every date, every officer involved, every circumstance in graphic detail, waiting for a judge who would come along, who would give her justice. And she said, one day, while I was praying, the Lord spoke to me and said, I have forgiven you. Why don't you forgive them? And she said, I went and got those records and threw them all in the fire. And she said, when tears were flowing down my cheeks, I felt an invasion of the love of God that flooded my soul that I have never known in all of my life. Who is it in your life? You need to take the mental records and throw it in the fire so that you can have a wonderful life. Why forgive? Not for the benefit of the other person, but for your benefit. Well, how often should I forgive? That's always a question. It was the question Peter asked. Shall I forgive seven times? And Peter did it because in the Mosaic law, if you forgave someone three times, you were really special. So Peter up the ante to seven because seven is the number of perfection. And he thought he was really being spiritual by offering the number seven. And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven, which is 490 times. Look at the prodigal son. And Jesus said the prodigal son had gone into a far country and he wasted his substance with riotous living. And when no man came to him, he was in that pig's pen, fighting them for something to eat. In his heart, he knew back home that he had a father that loved him enough to forgive him. And that knowledge saved his life. He got up and he shook the slime off of his body and started walking the long road home. The father was watching for him. And while he was a long way off, the father ran down the path to his boy. Here was the boy in rags who had the stench of a pig and he put his arms around him and embraced him and said, bring the robe, bring the ring, bring the shoes, my son is home. His forgiving love saved that boy's life. How many prodigal sons and daughters are in the far country right now wondering if there's enough love in their home, in their father's heart, in their mother's heart to give them the opportunity to try one more time? If there's love enough in a mother's heart to save them? I challenge you to pick up the phone and give your prodigals another chance. It might save their life. Two questions. Who do you need to forgive? And do you need God's forgiveness yourself?